Welcome, you are tuned to Cafe Cabaret. Today, Cafe Cabaret presents Blues Views with Jim Infantino, Francis Domeno, and the Hazley Pays introducing the inn with interview. Model UN with Tony, um, Francis Domeno, Jim Van Aaron, Evan Kornfeld, Charlie Fox, and Chad Crum, among others. And now, Cafe Cabaret presents Blues Views. <laughs> Some voice you can't even hear. It's like. like <laughs> what do you say? I just matter. It's light. Who gives a fuck? Pass the volume. Pass the coat. Yeah. <laughs> I heard happy. I must be happy. That's good.
door. Jump out the window. I won't let you jump out. Conspiracy in 1968, and didn't you go over the Canadian border with several 14 year olds that you initiated into a cult with a satanic sacrifice? Now, uh, you couldn't be a teenager to get into there. Uh, that's, your, your information's totally incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. I, well, is it true that you had a counterfeiting ring based in Oregon and that you just manufactured $20 uh, bills? Oh, uh, yeah. But what, what about the charges that you've actually stolen every, every song you've ever written from the band We the People? Yeah. yeah. Yes or no? I've never heard of it. No, yes or no? Where's the Xanax? I think he's had an epilepsy Xanax. Wait a minute. Oh my God. Oh my God. Wait a minute. Oh my God. Wait a minute. Oh my God. Wait a minute. 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 Wait a all right. All right. Now, as the boys reenact the scene from Deliverance, uh, 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 uh. we're going to ask them about this, this here song they're going to do for us. That, that what was that real mellow acoustic thing you were doing earlier on, back when we were doing? No, no, no. You know the one. I mean. The one at the very beginning. You, know, you, you, you were warming up with it. And you say, "Let's do this one." Well, why don't you do Why don't you do it? Still have no heat, man.
practice that a couple more times. Well, I don't know. Good well, enough for the underwear. We just got a phone call from the FBI, uh, and they said that you got to stay right here. You're under house arrest. How? Um, yeah, we live in an apartment. It's let's go to the street, but up on the roof. They, the the roof. they won't even find us. They won't. Yeah, they let's won't. go to the roof. Nah. Oh, oh man. They won't then we're going to get busted. We better, we, we're going to the here, roof. We better smoke you, a bottle of we're bottle. Gonna get, look, you're going to get me in big trouble because we're, we're dealing crack and stuff. <laughs> we haven't even paid this month's rent. So just yeah. please yeah. leave. Yeah. Just please leave. Well, before I go. Wait a minute. Okay. Would you folks do another one? That was just so lovely. Well. Another bomb hit? No, 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 no. Let me, a song. Another song. Do we know anymore? Uh, let's make one. We know that one backwards. Let's do make one. Because you know, when I came in here, I, I really didn't like you guys, but now I think you're really? all my friends. And okay, well, I, know you I know you understand me. I know you understand me because you, you're all my friends. And we've been here for a long time. We have been and here. And look, and we've been serving all some chicken. That's what's getting to us. We've been here for so long. We were in Peyton Place playing the spoon. We were, and we need some chicken. Because, look. No, no chicken. You know me. I've been here for a long time. Two don't years. You, you Listen, remember us, don't you? I don't care what they say. In the same room. I think you're all right. Uh, God, man. How's your whole family? What's that? <laughs> Being in the same room. The whole is fine, and my family is, family is too. That, now, how is your whole family? My whole is uh, fine, and my family is too. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's, uh... <laughs> What do you want to make up? It seems like we did make up. We don't wear makeup. Oh, I'm sorry. We, we weren't brought here by our own free will. We were part of an ex a scientific experience. We're from the experiment. Experience. Experience. Uh, the planet of nowhere. We're traveling through these voids of time. Is it true that you can read graffiti? No. You can only spray graffiti. If you read that in the book, uh, graffiti spaghetti. What? Okay, what would you like to hear? That one backwards or Super Califacialistic and Yeah, let's do that one. Am I greatly in your way here? Conjunction, junction, what's your function?
heavy machinery, forklifts, 18 wheelers, you name it, the inn will operate it. Next Where year, before the whole world what they were unable to achieve vis-a-vis -vis their own compatriots. <coughs> In recognition of the ambiguous nature of my position, therefore, I feel that what I am about to say is all I can safely say without offending anyone, <laughs> orbis et orbis, in the city and in the world. As representative of the United States to the United Nations, I would like to propose that Beethoven's Hymn to Joy, the climax of his Titanic Ninth Symphony, be officially adopted as the anthem of the United Nations. <laughs> now, Verdi wrote a hymn of the nations, which was happily performed by Arturo Toscanini, at the inaugural ceremonies of the United Nations. But as great as Verdi's work is, I believe that Beethoven's, which has the virtue of being universally known and loved all over the world, is more appropriate for its magnificent message. Alle Menschen werden Brüder. All men will be brothers. It exhorts them. <clears throat> it exhorts them to embrace each other in an unexcluding fraternal embrace. Sein zum Schlungen Millionen diesen Gruß den ganzen Welt. Be embraced, O oh ye millions in the kiss of the whole world. Often, often it takes music, great transcendent music, to write, to unite people, <laughs> as words and ideas alone cannot. <clears throat> it is this Olympian music which carries us beyond mere thought on the surge of its emotional and spiritual power. The universal language which needs no dictionaries or grammars to love and understand. Indeed, music is the supposed language of the angel, the very divinity, and the spheres as they make their rounds in space. If we began each meeting of the United Nations with the words of Schiller and the music of Beethoven in our hearts as well as in our mouths, who knows how our attitude and our work might improve? <coughs> Certainly our moods and goodwill would improve, I think so, very sincerely. <coughs> Since the whole human race, whose hopes and aspirations are centered on the work of the United Nations, it would be best expressed in the great musical legacy 
we have from that gigantic benefactor of the human race, Ludwig van Beethoven. What a wonderful way to be rededicated to the original principles of the United Nations. This is our opportunity. We who represent mankind in the congregation of the nations of the world. Let us bend all our efforts to try to arbitrate more than to send so-called peacekeeping troops to extinguish conflagrations <coughs> already started, to prevent the beginning of wars more than to try to stop them once they have begun to rid mankind once for all <laughs> of the plague of war, worse than earthquakes, as devastating as they can be, tidal, tidal waves, holes in the ozone layers, <laughs> and the most devastating catastrophes of nature. The war can be prevented if natural disasters cannot, at least not yet. What we need is men of real good will, infinite patience, and a great deal of human compassion for the little people, the helpless ones of the world, who tend to suffer the most, having the fewest resources self-protection. So, let us intone with Beethoven. I'm going to get away from it. <laughs> Sein und schlungen Millionen diesen Fuß until the great anthem becomes embodied in all of us here as a true article of faith for the salvation of all mankind. Thank you for your indulgence. church choir, she couldn't say no. Choose away of her too. The League of Women Voters has little committees nibbling. The clothing 
exchange, the PTO, she often beats the case, dishes herself up seeming to the rabbit of school as fourth grade room mother. The phone rings, a steady scream of hunger. We wanting more Susan. Susan the speaker, Susan the organizer, Susan the envelope licker. <laughs> she tries to fill everyone up in all the gluttony of filling stomachs. Her own three children take greedy gulps whenever they can. Her husband has learned to feed himself. January 9, 9.22 a.m., a Possum Road resident, resident called the police to report a suspicious motor vehicle on Possum Road at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> police checked and found the vehicle belongs to another Possum Road resident. <laughs> January 10, 12.35 p.m., a suspicious man was reported walking on Route 117 westbound west of Worth. Church Street, upon investigation, it turned out to be a person out for a walk, <laughs> according to police report. <laughs> January 11th at 3.15 p.m., police escorted a nervous husband, taking his wife to the hospital to have a baby. 10.18 a.m., a suspicious person reported on Cabot Road was found to be a meter reader. <laughs> 4 p.m., a Draper Road resident reported seeing two men driving, quote, from house to house, end quote, in a beige Ford, writing down information. <laughs> January 13, 4, 37 p.m., Janice Knowles called to report picketers on her property. She requested that they move. Police responded, and they all moved. <laughs> 7.45 p.m., a Loring Road resident called to report his flag was missing from his side yard. He wanted it noted. 11.20 p.m., police received a report of a dark gray BMW backing down Route 20 westbound. Police were unable to locate the vehicle. <laughs> January 15, 2.36 p.m., police received a report of two suspicious males at the western mobile station. Police checked the area and found they were just talking. <laughs> Our communities have borne the burden of such suspicion, such boredom, and such unrest too long. Past administrations have left this problem entirely to us alone. <coughs> Let's share the burden. This administration aims to bring these problems to your community. <laughs> <laughs> we will share them with the inner city and bring them to rural America as well. Thank you. Well, now we're going to bring Jim Ben Aaron up. Now we're like, we, we're, we, we started with me, which was like, you know, uh, zero is cool. We got Fred, who's a, you know, up on the park. And now Jim is gonna like, uh, rock the start up before your very eyes, Mr. Jim Bangham. Thank you, Francis. 
I was wondering. If you're born again, do you get two birthdays? So I'll do it if I can get more stuff. I was going to do political stuff tonight, but no, that's not right. So I'm just going to do random stuff, like go through my list and whatever looks good. I was thinking about my driving test. Was anybody here nervous during the driving test? You know, because I was nervous, not because I couldn't drive, but because the guy had a gun. Why do the registry cops have guns? I'm like, I don't understand it. So we got out on the road. He saw me once. He's like, pull into traffic, you know, stop at the light, you know, take a right. He's like, okay, parallel park outside that liquor store. So I parallel park. Like, I'll be right back. Get the engine running. Okay, he's out of the car. I'm like, what's going on? Comes running back in, takes a stock. I'm like, okay, hit it. Take a left. And he's making out the pink slip. So I'm like, psych. <laughs> If you're bored, go into Boston and ask for directions to something, and you know where it is. Don't tell the people that, and if they don't know or they get it wrong, taunt them. Wrong, no nuts. Trinity Church is in Copley Square opposite the public library. What are you, stupid? I took a tour in Spain. They, uh, the guy giving the tour, he was speaking in Spanish, but it was rough because he needed a translator into Spanish. El Casa El Grande. He said, Esta El Casa Grande. It really happened. Yeah. Lying's important. Think about it. The more, the more, the more fun something is, the more you lie about it. Lie about sex, lie about drinking. And like, it's really important that there is lying because none of us will be here. No one get laid if you couldn't lie. And that's the truth. I learned about lying at a young age with my mother. I got into a fight in high school, and in high school, you know, fight's kind of a big deal. They kick you out of school, and they, uh, they call your house and everything. So I get home, I know I'm in trouble. I burst through the door, I'm like, Mom, I got in a fight! It was great! She's like, cold, you know? I know. The school called me. You're in a lot of trouble. I'm like, Mom, I killed him. It was excellent. So, like, when your father gets home, you don't know how much trouble you're going to be. Fighting's wrong, son. You could hurt yourself. You could hurt someone. I'm like, Mom, he called you a dinosaur neck. She's like, oh, oh, well, that's very different. Um, never mind. You guys don't like that. Open up a phone sex line for women to make more money. It goes like this. Hi, I'm a dentist. No, you look great at that way. You don't, need, you don't need to lose any weight. Let's take a spontaneous vacation. Aruba or the south of France? You call that? If the audience is paying attention, this sometimes works. I need a new job, and I was reading a translation of a magazine for Japanese housewife, uh, Japanese career women, and it said uh, in the classifieds that they could get uh, baseball Caucasian husbands by mail. How do I get that job? See, that wasn't your fault. That was my fault. Yeah. Because I said housewives, and that uh, just dropped the ball right there. I said, but you know, getting married is, is good. I saw a wedding down behind the Bow and Arrow Pub last weekend. It was like a horse around carriage up front. I'm going back, I'm like, really beautiful big horse there. And I didn't really have anyone around it that I could see. I'm looking at this horse, this magnificent creature. And uh, then this guy in like a hat and tails, he comes around the side and looks at me like I'm doing something wrong. I'm like, nice cow. But I wanted to know why the horse was there. So I went up the steps, I look into the vestibule, and the bride's there in white, and she looks really pretty. And there's no one around, I guess she was just about, some of you, like her father's gonna come back in and lead her down the aisle. It's a really pretty sight, and she looked fantastic. And I wanted to say something, because she saw me, and I'm like way out of context, I'm dressed like this. And she looks at me, and she kind of smiles, and I'm like, well, what can I say, you know, because this is a big day for her, it's really important. And I wanted to say something nice, like, you know, you look like an angel, or never forget this day, treasure it forever, but, but what came out was, was different. What came out was, I saw the groom boink a black prostitute at the bachelor party on Friday night, and you're going to get AIDS now. <laughs> so she was crying at her wedding, that was touching. Yeah. Touching, she was crying, right? <laughs> Near the Birds was a docudrama. Animal Farm is a true story. This Christmas watch for Frosty the Abominable Mutant Snowman in a Nuclear Winter Wonderland. Okay, we'll wrap it up here. I'll tell you about my Vietnamese girlfriend. I had this girlfriend, she was from Vietnam, and we didn't get along too well because our backgrounds, I think, were so very different. You know, I grew up in the suburbs, played with league baseball, 
you know, I went through all the grades and stuff. I was thinking, you know, and I didn't grow up adrift in the South Pacific in a state of semi-starvation with 200 other people on a 40-foot long boat, which she did. And there was a language barrier too, you know, just as if the cultural stuff wasn't enough. The language barrier was really rough too. She could speak English, but if she got excited, if we got into a fight, we had some real, real bad fights. If we got into a fight, you know, she could she couldn't keep up in, in English, and she'd start speaking Vietnamese. And she'd make big scenes in restaurants. We'd be sitting there, and she'd start. She'd say, "Hey, boy, come, come now, come to Jataka." I'm like, "Who? What do you say to that?" So, uh, you know, I did my best. I didn't want to uh, make a scene or anything. So I uh, stand up on the table. I put my chair in. Go back. I say. And she gets more pissed off, you know, like, like I'm not giving her respect. Thank you. That's an R. Come on up, Francis. Wow, watch that. Watch it. You know, you're respect. What? Jim Ben here. And now I'm going to bring up yet another comic, but a fella is just going to make you look at life a whole different way. Yes, the funny side of life with my good friend and a long time open mic veteran, Mr. Evan Cornfeld. I don't know why I'm doing this. I think I started out on the wrong foot in life. When I was born, my mother had my first film. I got bad reviews. The, wor the worst part was my twin brother got good reviews. It created sort of a tension between us. When we were eight years old, he tried to kill me. It's true. Put glue in my oatmeal. Didn't talk to him for a long time after that. My family, we lived next door to the skydiving school. One day this guy came down in our backyard his parachute got tangled up in the branches of this old oak tree that we had. So my brother and I, we climbed up in the branches, and we found that by pulling on the ropes, we could use this guy like a marionette. So we put on a puppet show for the kids in the neighborhood. But then our mother came out and yelled at us. It seems we weren't supposed to play with things that didn't belong to us. So we left them up there. Made a lot of noise at first, kept us awake at night. But after a while, he quieted down. Then he started to attract, then he started to attract dogs and cats from around the neighborhood. But now he's just a conversation piece. Recently, took a class in rock climbing. He had to start off small. We start off climbing gravel. <laughs> Then we worked, up our, worked our way up the curb stones, but I found out I'm afraid of heights, so I had to drop out. Then I took a class in Zen Buddhism. I didn't do any of the readings, I didn't do any of the homework, and I never went to class. I got an A+. Plus. <laughs> parents didn't understand me when I was growing up. They put a lot of pressure on me to become a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. I couldn't make them understand that my real dream in life was to become the king of polka music. I know, I know that I have it in me to, uh, to do a really awesome rendition of Roll Up the Barrel. But they wouldn't give me the money to buy an accordion. So I decided to make one. Ripped the keyboard off my parents' grand piano. I glued it onto the vacuum cleaner. Worked pretty well, I thought. Finally, I ran away from home because I couldn't stand it anymore. I joined the circus. I became the personal manager for the dog-faced boy. I took pretty good care of him. He got really sick once, and I called the doctor. I could tell he was sick because his nose was warm. But he wouldn't listen to my advice, though. 
He ran off to Hollywood to pursue a career in movies. He saw himself as a sort of a cross between Robert Redford and Benji. Impression. Now we're going to bring up an impression of those good impressions, original impressions, impressions you've never seen before, impressions that'll leave an impression on you. His name's Charlie Quox. He's a first time here, so be kind. Charlie, come on up. Let's get it right this time. Hey, how's everyone doing tonight? Huh? What a crowd here. Yeah. Hey. Well, I tell you, I love a crowd. I love a crowd. I'll tell you, last week was a rough shape, though, you know? But I'm doing all right now. You know, last week I was in rough shape, you know? I'll tell you, I uh, work at uh, Meineke Muffin and I got caught straight with Pee Wee Herman. I lost my job over it and everything. Hey, he comes in with that voice, he drives me crazy. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> I'm not going to pay a lot for this muffler. <laughs> Last night I dreamt I was a muffler. Yeah. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'll tell you. I said, Pee Wee, we're not going to charge you. You're a famous celebrity. As a matter of fact, exhaust is the secret word. And you know what happens when you say the secret word? Ah! I grab it. It's in his voice. Can you imagine waking up to a, uh, a Pee Wee alarm clock in the morning? Well, that's enough to make you call your boss. Well, look, my day's all fucked up. <laughs> no way am I coming into work, you know? Or well, how about a James Brown alarm clock? That would really wake me up. Hey, hey, hey! Cinnamon, cinnamon, hey! And I'll tell you, if anyone should give Pee Wee advice, I figure it'd be a guy like uh, Jack Nicholson. Well, to tell you the truth there, Doc, I guess it's because I fight and fuck a lot. You know what I mean there, Chief? Just your average honey little devil there, Doc. Why they get a load of me? Hey, Jack. You know, Jack Nicholson saw this uh, indecent exposure act and was called in to testify. And the judge said to him, uh, you swear to tell the whole truth, not but truth to help you, God? Nicholson looked at him and said, I swear to God, Your Honor, I swear to God. He said, well, what did you see? Exactly what did you see? He goes, Your Honor, I seen him fucking. He says, you can't use that kind of language in here. This is a court of law. You're going to have to describe in your own words what you saw. Well, Your Honor, his pants were down below his knees. His balls were dangling in the breeze. His dick was in the forest ahead. That ain't fucking, I'll take the chair, Your Honor, I'll take the chair. Well, thank you. Hey, the other day I read it uh, in Star Magazine that uh, Clint Eastwood has a new cooking show out called Clint's Hints. And he opens up the show in this fashion. My name is Clint and I'm talking to him. I know what you're thinking out there, but I use five or six days to make this cake. But to tell you the truth, I kind of lost track of myself. But see, now this is a hell's egg, the most powerful egg being made, and it can whip your head to cake clean off. You got to ask yourself a question. Do you feel lucky or do you funk? Go ahead. <laughs> Make my cake. Hey, imagine if you had like Rocky Balboa on his show, right? And Rocky comes out with this side of beef, he's gonna show Clint how to tenderize the beef. Hey, yo, Clint, how you doing there? Yeah, it's me, Rocky, yeah. I'll tell you, when you want to tenderize the beef, you gotta talk, you gotta hit it first, you know? <laughs> I'll tell you, you gotta talk to it. My name is Sly, I'll tell you no lie. You mess with me, you're gonna fry, you know what I mean? Hey, so I gotta say hello to Adrian out there. Yo, Adrian, how you doing? 
Hey, right, listen, Clint, I gotta go. I gotta do something new. Rocky 92. I tell you, there's no end to that guy. While Jeffrey micturates, I guess we'll just go over the special guest stars that we've all invited down here. Well, of course, we have the lovely Elaine Gold Garcia. Uh, yeah, she's practically a fixture here. And <laughs> Don't let her do that to you, Elaine. Don't let her embarrass you like that. I'm not embarrassing her. I'm calling attention to her. And let's see, we got uh, our sound man, Mike. He thought he's always ready with uh, a cable or a laugh and or a, light. or a light and yeah and we got blue our video technician and mastermind and he wears a hat with a hole in the top so you think it's a raccoon tail hanging out but it's actually his hair and that's a pretty nifty trick and uh let's see we're gonna have the ghost of jackie gleason and he's gonna drink some whiskey out of a coffee cup and he's gonna pretend like it's coffee but we all know it's whiskey and uh what other beloved old entertainers' spirits are going to be present in this room when we do the open mic, which is, oh yeah, Arthur Godfrey. Uh, he's going to talk for half an hour about the merits of Maxwell House coffee, and you're all going to love that because it's going to be much more entertaining than what he really does. Chock full of nuts. Oh, I'm sorry. It's chock full of nuts that he used to talk about. Boy, we got some real old timers in the audience here. Can't get away with nothing when, when you got some over 30s because... They'll call you. I guess that's the difference between the over 30 crowd and the under 30 crowd. The under 30 crowd, they just uh, say, ah, what an idiot. The over 30s. Lipton tea. Lipton tea. tea. There probably was Lipton tea, given the weak tea delivery of Arthur Godfrey. It must have been. Celebrities who endorse products who are just like them. I can't think of any celebrities. Who, where have all the real celebrities gone? Art Linkletter for... Quaaludes, when your daughter takes too much LSD, <laughs> give her one of these. You'll love it. Friends, what class do you endorse? Oh, boy. You know, that's a mighty good question. How's about... Uh, no, no, it's when you can't sleep. Watch Francis. Okay. I would endorse Ghost Off. Ghost Off kills them dead, dead, dead. Ghost Off gets them in the cracks and crannies where they like to hide. Ghost Off. Yeah, let's see, what else? Uh, mm, our special, our next special Poltergeist guest star, none other than Linda Blair. She's gonna spit real pea soup. Thanks for turning off the, uh, the blower. That's, that's a real nice touch, that blower. It's sort of like um, talking inside of a car wash. I used to work in a car wash. And my dad, in a touching display of parental love, gave me a pair of earplugs because the decibel level in there went to 120. He called me on Christmas Day. Come on down to the car wash. We need somebody. Dad, you gotta be joking. No, I'm serious. Ha ha ha, Dad, you're such a joker. And they hung up on him. Didn't talk to him again for eight days. And finally, when I did go to visit him in his apartment on Winebiddle Street, his new wife said, Ah, the return of the prodigal son. Just a touching story from my autobiography. I thought I'd share that with you. I'm getting off the track, though. We have all these special guest stars, but you know, I can't think of a single one of them. Uh, my mind's a veritable blank. Oh, we got um, Joseph Christ. He built all the tables in here, as you can see. And if you're not careful, and if you don't like put an ashtray on them, they'll float three inches in the air. That's why we have the glass ashtrays. And let's see, who else we got? Um, hmm. Oh, we got the car from My Mother the Car parked out in the um, Brookline Avenue. Um, and it's a very handy thing to have your mother's dead spirit embodied in an old Model T because when the cop tries to tow it away, it says, Ray! Ray! Well, no, I guess it wouldn't really say that, but... Good grief! El Stinko. Frank, why don't you do something cute, like blow your nose on the microphone. Now, uh, let's see. Other famous guest stars. W.C. Fields. Um, he's going to come up here and tell you that you can't cheat an honest man. Um, and he should know. 
Um, let's see. Maybe I'll talk about the tractor trailer finishing school. This is something I've been meaning to get to. As long as there's only a few people here, I might as well. Um, it's in my bag. Now, feel free to throw your money in that hat, by the way. Don't let the fact that it's sitting there on this long table intimidate you anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I noticed these bags. Hey, great. It's called busking. You play for the money they throw. It's sort of like Cher in Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves. I don't even essay to do an impersonation of Cher. My former girlfriend who moved to Indiana did such a lovely one last time she was here. Now, how do you do it? Your former girlfriend. Uh, how about you? What do you know? You, you weren't there, Jeffrey. Why, why did she move to Indiana? Because well, Jeff, Jeffrey was hounding her. Yeah. He was saying, He's not your boyfriend, I am. And she said, Jeffrey, you're not my boyfriend, you're my caveman friend. Uh, anyway, I like to kid Jeff, but seriously, he's the salt of the earth. Of course, we all know that salt causes heart attacks. I'm gonna have a heart attack, you keep heckling me. Uh, note this sensitively drawn photo of a uh, big rig. Now, if, you know, it's sort of on, a, on an angle, it's red. What does it remind you of? A yeah, okay. Hey, lady, woo woo! Who said a penis? Well, speaking of which, um, can, can all of you see this? This was in the bakery yesterday. Um, you see the before shot, that was then. A skinny, malnourished waitress resentfully balancing a tray full of garbage in front of a smoke background. And the after photo, this is now. This LSD brain injured waitress finished her course at the tractor trailer finishing school. Now she's become a dyke. You know, the thing is, I don't have anything against dykes. If a woman wants to be a dyke, I won't hold it against her. That's just a little joke I like to tell. <laughs> But she's posing in front of this truck. She's giving the black power a salute. She's dressed in some ludicrous cowboy outfit. Her kidneys are shot to hell. Not that she ever gets to drive this tractor trailer. How many female tractor trailer drivers do you know about? Exactly none. So my guess is that she's actually um, starting her own tractor trailer school. It's called the Tractor Trailer Finishing School. And you learn how to drink seven cups of coffee in five minutes. And you learn how to avert your gaze when uh, people are having sexual intercourse in the back seat of the car that you can look down on from your 18-foot cab. And you learn how to put a dollar bill in the front of a waitress's blouse with two fingers. Yes, it's the type of finesse you only learn at the tractor trailer finishing school. Now, we do have a real special guest, somebody who's not one of these artificial special guests. Um, he wanted to perform first. Does he still want to perform? Sure. Well, come on down. I can't see a thing in these glasses, so you're going to have to tell me your name. You look good. You look great. Hey, thanks. Get off the stage, you goddamn galoot! Hey, wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. I have to, I have to cough some phlegm onto the microphone. Ah. <coughs> uh, Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Anointed <laughs> him. Yes, anoint me in rubbing alcohol. And then the front four of the Jets will be my disciples. Hi out there in uh, Cambridge Cable TV land. Yeah, you wish. Uh, okay, what's your name? Chad Crump. Chad Crump. We had Chad here a couple weeks ago. He thank did. you all for coming to see you guys. Black. Black Book. We have a really big show here for you tonight. Black Take it away, Francis. He was terrific. And he's going to be even more terrific now that he has this huge howling audience to perform in front of. That's right. I give you Chad Crump.
suitcase, real inexpensive. I'm light, no, no hassle free. <laughs> Thank you. 
abortion rights, human, gay, and voting rights. The neighbors who support this effort are signing a statement, becoming a sponsor, and giving a contribution today, and it just takes a moment to see what the effort's all about. Okay, so we've all just been introduced to the Rainbow Lobby. And in fact, many of you who are watching this uh, program uh, may have heard these very same words because they're being said thousands of times a day uh, to thousands of people on street corners, on doors, all across the country from Harvard Square to San Francisco to Atlanta to Chicago. And I want to thank Lou for having the Rainbow Lobby staff here in Boston on his show so that we can talk about our efforts to promote fair elections and democracy both nationally and internationally. And first we're gonna introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Kate Gardner. I'm the Canvas Director. I coordinate the recruitment and hiring of canvassers to go door to door to sign up members into the Rainbow Lobby. I'm Elise Lindell, and I'm the crew manager, and I'm responsible for the everyday political and skills training of our can grassroots canvas for lobbyists. Hi, my name's Sandy Friedman, and I've been working on distributing these flyers throughout the city, looking for folks who are concerned about protecting civil rights, women's rights, abortion, and gay rights, people who want a job this year fighting the right, and are looking forward to getting paid to do it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe Spirito. I'm the turf manager for the operation. It's my job to scout every neighborhood and know every neighborhood in the state, so we make sure a Rainbow Lobby canvasser knocks on every door and speaks to everyone in every household in the state. I'm Robert Lagos, and I, I just joined uh, the Rainbow Lobby, and uh, I was, was attracted by the you know, their uh,
discussions that we're tackling right now, and the Rainbow Lobby does take an uncompromising stand on these issues, and I want to too. Great. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was going to say there are two things to know about the lobby, but there's actually three. The first is that we have a great staff. <laughs> Um, the second is that we're building a grassroots network that gives us the political clout that we need in Washington, D.C. We already have 140,000 members, sponsors, and contributors all across the country, and we're growing rapidly, which means that we are always looking for new people to hire to come and help us build that network. The third thing to know is that we're the democracy lobby. And we believe that the fundamental issue is the erosion of democracy and that the fight to strengthen and expand participatory democracy is key. We're independent. That means we're independent of the Democratic and Republican parties. We were founded as a nonpartisan lobby in 1984 by the Rainbow Alliance, which is not the Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> The Alliance was a confederation of individuals and organizations in the independent progressive political movement. People like Thomas Hobbs, representatives from the uh, California Peace and Freedom Party, uh, Vermont's Liberty Union Party, Wisconsin Labor Far Party, the National New Alliance Party. They all shared a common commitment to the rainbow social vision and believed that that vision of inclusion would only be realized through the opening up of the electoral process to independent views and to insurgent candidates. So in order to effectively challenge the almost insuperable legal restrictions to independent candidates being able to run, they opened the Rainbow Lobby office in Washington, D.C. And over the last four years, under the directorship of Nancy Ross, the Rainbow Lobby has become, according to the New York Times, the 11th largest lobby in the country. And we've become involved with many, many different issues which many folks here have spoken about. And we've authored a National AIDS Bill of Rights, which would protect people with AIDS and people in high-risk groups from discrimination in terms of housing, employment, medical care. With Representative Ron Dellums of California, we have pioneered legislation to cut off military aid to the brutal, self-declared dictator for life of Zaire. In fact, this last uh, month, uh, many of us, we all, part many of us here, participated in a grassroots information campaign um, against this dictator when he came to this country to visit President Bush approached by many community organizations, you know, Lowell environmentalists, uh, uh, Head Start educators from New Jersey, the Chippewa tribe from Minnesota, people who have approached the Rainbow Lobby for legislative research and access to Congress. But what's fundamental is the Rainbow Lobby's commitment to fair election and democracy. That's what underlies all of these issues and makes it possible for us to fight for them. So we want to talk a little bit more about the crisis in democracy that we face in this country and what the Rainbow Lobby is doing about that. Okay, so what is this crisis? What is this erosion of democracy? Well, after this last election, it was the lowest voter turnout since 1920. And there's been a lot of polls and um, anal an analyses to discuss why that is. Um, one indication, um, one poll was that the United States is now the lowest voter turnout of any industrialized democracy in the world. We actually beat out South Africa where not even all their citizens have the right to vote. Um, in fact, as the ones of us who did vote, 66% of us did not like either one of the two choices. An ABC poll showed that 71% of us believe that candidates will say anything, make any promise just to get in office. So that's a heavy statement on the election process and who, who the candidates are in this country. And in fact, what that yields is that 98.5% of our elected officials get re-elected. So you think we have a permanent Supreme Court, let's well, look at the government that's real permanent. So this kind of exclusionary political process, which is obviously dictated by big PAC money, manipulated by the media, and special interest groups that follow accordingly, leaves a real enormous gap between the majority of our concerns in this country. So 
for example, 85% of the American people support a national health care policy. It has a lot to do with 37 million of us having no health care policy at all. Over 75%, according to the last LA Times poll, show that the American people are pro-choice. The last National Globe actually poll showed that over 50% of us support um, abortion as a constitutional right. The majority of American people support full sanctions against the South African government, support cleaning up the environment no matter what cost, support increasing their own taxes as a means doing away with homelessness in this country, etc. So what's the response in Congress? Well, there's a national health care policy that's been sitting in Congress for 18 years. Full sanctions would not pass during the last Congress in the Senate. The um, response to abortion in this country, which has people up in arms, was flag burning. That was the response in Congress to abortion. Um, the environment obviously continues to fall apart in front of our faces. Homelessness is increasing, and the educational system has one of many of those social service or many of the issues that people are concerned with obviously is decaying as well. So what are we going to do about that? So we've all been taught that it's through the electoral process that we would be able to get a chance to formulate social policy in this country. That we've been taught that that's exactly what participatory democracy is all about. But the reality is, over the last four years, that any possibility of participating in that process has been clearly eroded. That there have been erected obstacles and barriers. There have been obstacles erected around ballot access laws that have made it virtually impossible for independents, for insurgents, to even get on the ballot. That we've seen in the past year the destruction of the fairness doctrine, which at least gave us a possibility of having an opposite point of view presented by the media. That there, it's almost a national shame that it's still possible, it's still virtually, it's still difficult to even register to vote in states around the country, even liberal states like this one, you can't register by mail. You can't even register at a post office, something that you can do for the draft, for instance. That PAC money, that <laughs> <laughs> It's true. <laughs> that, that we've seen more and more that the that money interest, that PAC, PAC has contributed $150 million to congressional candidates last year to incumbents. More than half the money of incumbents now come from PACs who swelled money from honorariums. It's become a virtual playground of multi-millionaires and handpicked politicians to the point where 52 Congress people last year ran completely unopposed. Completely unopposed because people couldn't even raise the money to mount a challenge, let alone a shot at winning an election. That we wanted to take a, a minute or two to focus on one particular issue, which is ballot access laws and the difficulty around ballot access laws in this country. That people don't recognize this particularly, but if you run for office in this country as a Democrat or Republican, let's say for president, you were only required to gather approximately 50,000 signatures to access the ballot at both 50 states. But run as an independent, you're required to gather more than a million and a half. It's turning independent third parties into virtual extinction in this country. But it's not just actually the barriers around signature requirements. Let's just take two states for instance, Florida. You need 56,000 plus signatures on a single postcard to get on the ballot in Florida, which means you need to gather about 100,000 signatures to ensure gathering 56,000 good ones. But you also have to submit to the state of Florida 10 cents for every signature for filing fees. In Florida, that means that you have to spend $10,000 just to assure a place on the ballot. North Carolina requires a five cent filing fee, over $5,000. Now, both of these states require not one single signature, if you're a Democrat or Republican, not one penny for a filing fee. That these barriers are just typical of what exists all throughout the country. So the package... Maybe you could say also what the fair elections, what the Rainbow Lobby's doing about that. Well, H.R. 1582, which was offered by the lobby, submitted by John Conyers, is a bill that equalizes and standardized ballot access throughout the country. But it was set up one-tenth of one percent of the last vote in the last election as the ballot access law for every single state, which in fact would still make it three or four times harder for an independent to run, but nothing like the 30, 35 times that now exists. And again, it gives us a chance to have another voice. Just think for a second of the presidential debates. Something that millions and millions of people watch in this country. Think of the obvious position the far right put out. The far right was saying, well, is the murderer the woman or is the murderer the doctor? 
there's no response from a progressive movement. Well, what would have meant to have had an independent, somebody who represented the position of the majority in this country, saying, wait a minute, it's a woman's right to choose. In fact, we're the majoritarian point of view. That we don't have to buy the, the lip service of the far right with no response at all. So that would give us a chance, in fact, to have our social vision articulated in this country. And in fact, the social vision of the both of them. the rainbow law of the implied support makes sense. It makes sense to most Americans. Most Americans support democracy. Legislation to allow us to register to vote by mail, opening up the ballot, campaign financing reform makes sense. Who, who would who would oppose this? Well, the answer to that question is Congress. Congress people like the election laws the way they are. I mean, if you're a congressman now, you're in office for life. Congress gets reelected, as I think Elise said, 98.5% of the time. You have lifetime job security, no matter how you vote on the issues. So you can ignore the majority of us and stay in office for life. So we're faced with an uphill battle, getting these Congress people to pass laws which make them more vulnerable to the electorate. We want them to be afraid of losing their jobs when they don't do their job, which is working for us. So the answer to have what to do is, is what the Rainbow Lobby is doing, what people in this room are doing, is going door to door, day after day, all over the country, signing up the ones and twos, the fives, six and seven neighbors across the country as members of a grassroots network that's fighting for democracy. It's people's signatures that get us in the door to meet with Congress people. That's what literally opens the door and gets them to sit down with us. It's the dollars that people are giving all over the country in 79 cities so far that fund our lobby in Washington, D.C., that allows us to maintain our full-time staff and lobbyists and lawyers. And it's people's memberships that makes Congress people pay attention. That's what they pay attention to, an ongoing, sustained organization of members, 140,000 strong right now across the country. That's why they're responding to this legislation. We're doing, in a way, what we did in the fight against Robert Bork a couple of years ago. A broad grassroots network was built that generated $15 million. We sent tens of thousands of postcards, letters, and telegrams to Congress. And what were, what were we doing? After all, we were just trying to make them do their job. It took $15 million to make them do their job and defeat a racist, right-wing, anti-woman, anti-poor judge that Reagan had nominated to the Supreme Court. The trouble was, though, that the day after we defeated Bork, Congress started going back to business as usual, and they put another right-winger on the Supreme Court, who's now part of the anti-civil rights, anti-abortion network. That's why a sustained, ongoing political organization is so critical. That's what our campuses do. Our campuses are foot soldiers in the fight to build a social movement in this country for democracy. That's what we all are. So that's the Rainbow Lobby. Really true that we, in fact, are the only rainbow organization in the country canvassing door to door. So, oh, really? yeah. uh, do you have any more questions? Do you? I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank you. 
primary focus? And that is not a primary. No, the primary focus of the Canvas is to build the membership organization in neighborhoods throughout the country, and that is the primary job. My primary job is to gain, gain members. Right. right. It's to build a membership build organization. The membership. And that's what the far right builds. The far right has enormous clout because they have enormous membership organizations. It generates literally millions and millions and millions a day, a day in this country. They far out fundraise us. And member organizations, that's like Lions Club and the, uh, the Rotary and those things? You think more of it like there's the moral majority membership organizations and then there's things like the Rainbow Lobby. Uh, moral majority membership is, is basically church congregations. But it works, it works very well. They have a very, they have very tight membership organizations. We make a lot going through the churches. But it's given them enormous clout. They're very organized. They can call up their people at the drop of a hat. They'll drop a postcard. They'll come out on a picket. They'll call up a congressperson. They'll vote. They'll vote. They'll vote. They'll vote. The far right generates votes. They know how to organize voting. So the voters are already there, and they're just organizing the ones that are there. You're trying to get new voters and get your get your people to think. No, we're trying to make our votes count. We're already there, but how can we register our voice in a process that's exclusionary and blocking us out? We're building a movement for democracy in this country. Real, real news. Yesterday, the uh, National Organization of Women. Right. Uh, put in a vote for a third party. Exactly. Uh, is this is this also are are you advocating a third party? No. You're not. No. Uh, We're a nonpartisan lobby. For lo for many years, we have said though that we can't depend on the two major parties to do anything about our issues, and that we need to open up the process to make it possible. You know, for us to have candidates that would. You know, for us to have clout, to, for us to force the candidates out there to be accountable for our issues. Right. So I think it's great that that now wants to do that. But our job is to, you know, make, I don't, it it's, make it possible. Right now, the laws on the books make it virtually impossible for them to run right. candidates. So that's exactly to your 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 comments earlier. I mean, the fantasy that we grew up in America that yes, you two can run for president. Think of it for a moment. Democrats and Republicans, like we talk about, have a particular access. If now wanted to start a political party. Why is it organized in such a way that it would be 35 times more difficult to run if they wanted to run that way? That's not our conception of democracy. None of us grew up with that understanding, but that's in fact the law. That's the law of the land. But people don't support that position. And in fact, we're teaching people that, and people respond by saying, I don't support that. I support fair elections, and they join. Yeah, it's a new way to understand democracy, that democracy it's not just the good old boy network, and you have, a, you know, democracy is not exercising voice. It's, you know, your voice between, you know, garbage can A and garbage can B. <laughs> That's not democracy. Well, it's not. Democracy is when the majority of people in this country have a variety of candidates, a variety of choices. We have a national dialogue. We have competition amongst candidates, and you vote for whomever you choose to vote for. We don't advocate the candidates or the political parties. But that democracy is the understanding that you can get represented in Washington. That's how we understand democracy, and that's not what's happening. And meanwhile, people are dying in the streets from homelessness. The environment is falling apart. There's some real serious issues at hand. So we can't keep going along. I mean, when abortion, civil rights, all these issues are getting flushed down the toilet, and you know, it's business as usual in Washington, and we can't afford that. Just be 
because my eyes are brown, my skin is brown, my hair is brown, that I have no color? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. I'm sorry. I really get tired of people thinking that I should speak Spanish. I mean, every time they come up to me when they're visiting my state, they say, gee, you know, where's a good Mexican restaurant? I don't ask them where it's what's the best uh, brand of TV dinner, you know what I mean? So they come up to me and they say, gee, you're from New Mexico, you're Hispanic, and you don't speak Spanish. And I stereotype back, gee, you're fat, and you don't speak pig like me? <laughs> Thank you, that's it, I gotta go, adios. <laughs> People, okay, so I apologize for being so mean old bitch. Oh, she's not mean. We love you so. Saturday, April 15th, 12 to 4 p.m., Boston Common Bandstand. Good all these advocacy people. I mean, we got Diane Dujon, Byron Rushing, Betty Richardson, Susanna Darling, Carol Doherty, Leslie Lawrence, Claire Allen, Chris Williams. Listen, all that fucking people got homes. Excuse my chair. I got one too. Does that mean I don't care about the homeless? Well, I might not. What can I say, you know? Got this piece in the mail. Urban Cross overnight. Actually, I didn't get it in the mail. Glenn Pettit handed it to me directly. Urban Cross overnight, Saturday, April 2 at 8 p.m. Free. I mean, this is a free gig at the Nameless Coffee House. Don't like to advertise the Nameless too much, but hey. Rick McIntyre is going to be your uh, host there. Step Pat, Carrie Doyle, Weep Wild, Glenn Bennett, my good friend. Looks like Zach, but it could be Lack. Comes up from the old Lower East Side. And Sarah laughs. I hope she has a good time while she's laughing. I hope it's a belly laugh. I haven't seen enough belly laughs in my life. Probably never will. I saw a great bunch of people, like Seamus and Finnegan. They were really funny. I liked them. A little bit loud, but you know what can you say? Just Beautiful. paid $37 the for tape this Sam week. Davis on truck. Going broke. Hey. So we only made 50. We'll get there. Now, what's this we like to, uh, week all about? Huh? What is it night. all about? warm you up a little bit with our version of uh, something that should be kind of standard in the jazz language by now. I'm sure you'll recognize it. We'll tell you what it is after we do it. Say a couple of words for Stone 
soup poets. Stone soup poets been around for 18 years. Got a birthday coming up the 2nd of May. Big show, big show. Charlie's Tap. Right on Green Street in Central Square. Hopefully they'll have a good time. I'll be there shooting it. It's a very interesting night to sit and watch poets. Them guys are crazy. I mean, they can say almost anything, as you can well tell. Shot earlier in the show of uh, Antonio Gerabito. And Rick Hospital was from the counter inauguration. Where in the Stone Soup Poets? I think the real question is, has there been a CIA coup? Could we get a recount on the last election and see if George Bush really won? Or if all the national projections of the media were set up by the CIA 
said information. How many people voted for George Bush? And how many voted for Governor Dukaka? I mean, I'm not saying either one of them is any better than the other because personally I think they're both politicians and should probably be tied to a whipping post. We know about whipping posts here in Massachusetts. We've used them. Both of them lie through their teeth. You know, neither one of them would answer a straight question because they were never asked a straight question by the media. Neither one of them asked each other a straight question. disgusted she couldn't handle it she split the country she'll be back someday you know but only after she recovers from this cia coup now for any of you don't know who i am what kind of politics i have i don't personally espouse any views politically i do ask questions interested in the questions more than the answers, mostly because you don't have any answers, you only have questions. Answers are a thing of time, they come and they go and they disappear and they fly around and they change depending on who's giving the answers. Now, so really, and it could be a sir or a madam. Every answer is totally right. And every answer is totally wrong. What a wonderful pattern. Now right here in Cambridge, and I do live in Cambridge, I'm easy to find. I got a telephone number. It's 864-6979. You can call me between 11 and 1 any day. You can tell me how you feel. You can tell me that I'm a complete jerk. You can tell me what a wonderful person I am. You could tell me anything you wanted to, and I have the right to hang up on you. Or I could say, my, thank you very much for telling me what a jerk I am. I needed that today. And today I feel like a total jerk. I mean, I just, my entire being radiates jerkdom. And I don't care. There's nothing I can do about it. I am slaving by God. I have done three o'clock in the morning for the last two weeks. I am up at seven o'clock every morning. I'm going on four hours. I'm totally just wired out on this video. I mean, it's worse than watching Randy Savage punch up his neck. And I just feel bad. Physically, I feel about exhausted. I hope I get tonight off. I never know until the last minute. My good friend and compatriot who calls me up to shoot all these wonderful things that you see. Billy Ruane, that founder of Hell Dorado, who does marvelous things, runs some of the best and worst shows I have ever seen. He tells me at the last minute, begs me on hands and knees. Would you please, please, please? Come out and practice your art. And I say, well, Bill, you know, you know how I am. Every chance I get to go out and shoot, I go out and shoot. I don't care where it is. I don't care when it is. If I got the time and the camera, I can shoot it. And will. Now, better than that, I cannot do it. Remember this song? 
Joseph and they be those kind, considerate human beings over at the Middle East restaurant. Hope that you have a pleasant life. Now, I personally hope that you will come over to my video display. As a video artist, one of the greatest problems is where to display our art. And I have been offered the opportunity to display my art in Joseph's Corner Bakery at the corner of Brookline and Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge. I put my videos on at 9 o'clock in the morning and I run them soon until 2 o'clock in the morning. Right now, they only go on until I leave. Soon, I will have to stay there until 2 o'clock to run my videos. Okay, I love them. Come over and see me, that's cool. This is a long-running display of my art. You will see some of the most incredible things you have ever seen. That's on the corner of Brookline and Mass Ave. I would like to thank very much these brothers, Joseph and Nabil, for allowing me to display my art so now let's see, is there anything else I can talk about? Um, you know, I'm still, even for all of this, Francis Domeno looked at me yesterday and he said, Blue, you are just wasted. You're, you should go to sleep, son. You should go to sleep. You should get some rest. You should not be this wild. Except I'm worried about the CIA. Uh, and and I'm on. worried about George so Bush. Sam Davis. And I'm worried about what these oil companies have done. Hatfield and I'm worried Ford. about the state of the Rick world. And I'm Ezra worried Ford. about these people who Howard have no food. And I'm worried about these Five people who guitar. talk about these people who Dave have no food Alfred. while living in their mansions. Howard on I'm talking about Donald Trump. Good Chip cartoon Tainer in the newspaper. Bone. Cartoon says, they sell every, all, these, all these luxuries I got trumpet. and feed the poor for a year. Listen. Trumpet, Stanton, what a great Have idea. Have we no true philanthropists in this world? Is everyone worried and about their final tax Copeland statement and whether or not they're going to have enough money to buy that that's, uh, new can of caviar tomorrow. The piece you just heard is the what opening about piece on our Come on, new rich people, Blue let's get our acting gear. Has the title Give of that everything piece. you it's called can, so what? not everything you want to give to save now money like on taxes. Give if it part hurts. Of the Give. By God, album these people are starving. African Game. And what are we, the richest nation in the world, doing about it? Complaining because we got a deficit owed to those countries which we built in Africa for after we bombed the hell out of them. Can you imagine 50% of the world deaths in the Second World War for civilians? Japan. We did. 
it's nice to be able to play this bullshit game. Get right down to it. We are the devil incarnate. The Jamaicans know it. The Jamaicans say it flat out. The Jamaicans say the white man's the devil. They come up here to rip us off. They don't come up here. I mean, they're nice. They smile. But by God, according to the Rastafarians, it's the white man who is the devil. You remember that when the time comes. Because if they take over, Jack, the devil gets put in hell. Now, I've just been ranting and raving, and I'm sure y'all are tired of listening to me. And I'm very sorry for that diatribe. I've just had it in my mind for several years. I mean, since 1965, I've had it in my mind. You know, since the Russians first came out and I knew who they were and everybody said how bad they were, I said, but God, they're poor. I mean, you know, they don't even got television, man. They don't got a car in every garage. They don't got a chicken in every pot. They got people in Russia right now that are as poor as any third world nation. And just overpopulating. I mean, just geez, man, like bunnies. They're just going boom, 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 man. More babies. Give me more babies. Why? Because we're not going to teach them anything. We're going to leave them ignorant. We're going to say, oh, well, you people are going to think you got to raise families so that the families can support you as you grow up on your farms. But then we're going to take the farms away from them and say, oh, no, now you got to go work in the factory. Cheap labor. My God, if I were a commie, which I am not, I would be very upset. Yeah. I personally, because I was raised right here in the good old USA, and I love my country, think that my country could do a whole hell of a lot more than it's doing. Bye.